Before we kick off today's episode, I just wanted to ask whether you had ever heard of Fruit of the Bean Coffee. They are an American whole bean roasted coffee company with a purpose. Matt Kay regularly drinks whole bean coffee before sitting down to edit the scripts and do the audio production. He loved their Costa Rica single origin beans and said it's easily the best coffee he's ever had and he's tried them all. The coffee arrives super fresh because they don't roast your beans until after you've ordered. And not only do Fruit of the Bean supply awesome coffee, but 10% of all of their net income goes to supporting orphans and those affected by human trafficking. Their owner Josh knows that in times of need, America needs coffee. That's why all of Fruit of the Bean's coffee range will be 20% off throughout this crisis until most companies in America are back on their feet. To access this offer, just go to their website www.fruitofthebean.com and the discount will be automatically applied. That's fruitofthebean.com. Drink coffee, do good. Warning, this episode deals with descriptions of a graphic nature. Listener discretion is advised. As the courtroom fell silent to hear the verdict, Judge Lord Nimmo Smith stated, quote, it lies beyond any skill of mine to look into the black depths of your mind. I can only look at what you have done. You have been convicted of a truly evil murder, one of the most appalling crimes that any of us can remember, and you would rightly be regarded as wicked. I have no idea what led you to do what you did. It may have been a desire for notoriety, to achieve something grotesque, I leave that to others to fathom. I'm Jess, and this is Skinwalker. Jodie Jones was born in 1989 to Judith and James Jones and had two elder siblings, a brother Joseph and a sister Janine. Her father James, known locally as Jimmy, was a postal worker. Jimmy had a history of mental illness, which culminated with him committing suicide in 1998, aged 39, by hanging himself from a tree in the family's back garden. He was discovered by Judith and her eldest son, Joseph. At the time, Jody was only nine years of age. However, her mother stated she handled the situation amazingly well, becoming her, quote, wee mentor. By 2003, Jodie Jones was now a fully-fledged teenager, living in East Houses on the outskirts of Dalkeef, a town in the county of Midlovian, 10 miles outside of Edinburgh. Sitting on the banks of the River Esk, it boasts expanses of wild, untamed country parks which provide an escape from the hustle and bustle of the city, despite only being a 20 minute drive away. She was primarily interested in her friends, her music scene, and was widely regarded as being mature for her age. Her mother Judith had a new partner named Alan, and her older brother Joseph and sister Janine still remained in the family home in East Houses. Jodie was well loved by her family, who affectionately referred to her as Toad. She lived the typical life of a teenager, however, she did experience some inner torment. Her diary contained what she described as, quote, the inner workings of a fucked up mind. Nonetheless, she enjoyed going out with her friends and had recently begun dating a local boy from her school named Luke Mitchell. Jodie attended St David's Roman Catholic High School in the town. She had met her boyfriend Luke whilst there, as he was in the year above. Within days, they were smitten and had embarked upon a sexual relationship. Whilst Luke had previous sexual experience, he was Jodie's first. Jodie and Luke both enjoyed rock and metal music 
primarily the music of Korn, Metallica and Nirvana. They classed themselves as members of the goth subculture and dressed accordingly. The goth subculture, which likely originated in the UK in the 1980s, was the haven for followers of gothic rock. Followers of the subculture are usually noticeable for their style of dress, which comprises of dark clothing and hairstyles, and often accentuate their look with white makeup on the face, giving a more gothic look. Marilyn Manson is one of the most commonly known and best recognised aspects of the subculture. The couple enjoyed smoking cannabis together, with Luke providing the drug not only for Jody, but their entire friend group. He would often be seen with hands darkened by cannabis resin and would shave their stash for the group using a pen knife he kept on himself at all times. Jodie had brown hair which she at times had braided and dyed with other colours to suit her gothic dress style. She had also recently gotten a lip piercing to match the piercing her boyfriend Luke had underneath his bottom lip. The pair had become inseparable in the three months they had been dating. They regularly spent time between both of their family homes, sitting in their respective bedrooms, listening to their favourite musical acts. As a sign of their blossoming love, Luke had even carved their initials into a tree in the woodlands between their homes. As school broke out for the day on June 30th, Jodie Jones, along with other pupils from St David's High School, headed home for the day. Jodie had recently been grounded, having been caught skipping school and smoking cannabis with her cousin. Judith Jones sat at home in East Houses when Jodie arrived home. Having let Jodie know she was no longer grounded, her daughter then came in to inform her that in that case, she was going to go and spend time with her boyfriend Luke. Judith informed Jodie that she expected to see her daughter back home by 10pm at the latest, as it was a Monday night. This allowed Jodie to spend an evening with Luke and still gave enough time for her to make the walk home and sleep for school the following day. Luke lived in nearby New Battle. This was handy news for Jodie and Luke, as it meant the two families' hometowns, New Battle and East Houses, were connected by a shortcut known as Roan's Dyke. Roan's Dyke is a cycling and walking path which directly connects the two areas and brought the journey time for the mile and a half walk down to somewhere between 20 and 25 minutes for the average person. Judith therefore assumed Jodie would leave Luke's house around 9.30pm to ensure she made it home in time. Jodie changed from her school uniform and Judith heard the door close as Jodie left the family home around 5pm to meet with Luke. Judith was acutely aware of Jodie's new beau. His name was Luke Mitchell, and he was semi-recognisable around the area. He had gotten into some minor trouble due to his love for cannabis, and was reportedly selling the drug to some of his friends. Despite this, he was a quiet and mannerly boy, who did not raise too many red flags for Jodie's family. By the time 10pm had come and gone, Judith noted that Jodie had still not yet returned. She began to feel restless and uneasy as she waited. The couple had begun dating around March of 2003, so the route was not an unfamiliar one to Jodie. If she had left for half past nine to enable her home for 10pm, she should have been home by now. With panic rising, Judith called Luke to check what time Jody had left his house at. If it had been later, she would have simply been en route and a stern telling off would suffice. Luke, however, was entirely surprised by the call. He stated to Judith that Jody had not been with him and that he had not seen her at all that night. He had apparently been out locally with his friends but without Jodie. Judith immediately hung up the phone as panic set in. She quickly called her friends and family to let them know Jodie was missing and the group began a search of the local area. The search party consisted of Judith Jones, her mother Alice Walker, along with her daughter Janine 
and her 19-year-old boyfriend, Stephen Kelly. Soon after, a worried-looking Luke joined Jodie's family alongside his pet dog, Mia, a German shepherd. By 11pm, Judith Jones had become so panicked by the disappearance, she called police to alert them to the possibility of her daughter being missing. The party walked together as they walked along the streets of East Houses and made their way to Rowan's Dyke, the wooded path that Jodie would typically use on her trips to and from Luke Mitchell's house. The weather was poor that night. It had begun to rain as the dark had descended. As they walked along the path searching for clues, Luke struggled to keep control of his dog Mia on the lead. She had been partially trained by a dog trainer to follow scents and pulled Luke hard off the path towards a denser area of woodland. They headed towards a wall which ran perpendicular to the search team. As Luke walked alongside this wall, being pulled by Mia all the while, he arrived at a V-shaped hole that had been fashioned by the walls crumbling over time. Luke climbed over what was left of the broken section of the wall, and the search party heard a call go up. As the search party arrived at the location Luke had discovered, they one by one found out the fate of the missing Jodie Jones. Luke climbed back out from the enclosed area, visibly shocked by what he had seen. The body of Jodie Jones lay dead and still on the ground amongst the bushes and trees of the woodland. Her clothes had been stripped from her as she lay naked. Her body had been badly mutilated, bearing several deep cuts and knife wounds. Forensic evidence would later show she had been struck on the head by a blunt object and had her throat compressed as she was strangled. The evidence of the mutilation to her body points to it having taken place post-mortem. The acts of violence committed against Jodie, pre- and post-mortem, included having her throat slit, alongside cuts to her eyelids, cheeks, abdomen, forearm and also her left breast. Despite being found with her clothes having been stripped off, Jodie was not sexually assaulted. A post-mortem did find that some of the wounds inflicted on Jodie had been defensive wounds, showing that she had likely struggled with her attacker before her death and it may have been possible for her to inflict some wounds in kind. As the police descended on the scene, they took the names of all of the searchers and took keen interest in one searcher in particular, Jodie's boyfriend and the discoverer of her body, Luke Mitchell. Luke was interviewed as to the events of that day, in the capacity of a potential witness, and stated that he had been informed by Jodie's mother that she hadn't returned home and he had volunteered to help in the search. He then went on to state that Mia, his dog, had become interested in something over the wall at the path and he had jumped through the break in the wall to check. Once through, he stated, quote, I saw this white thing which stuck out in the light. I could see it was legs. It looked like a tailor's dummy. Mitchell told police that he had been at home helping cook dinner, which he had managed to burn, before going out with friends later. He was released from the police station that same day as investigations into the murder continued. Many of the first run statements given by witnesses directly supported the version of events which Luke Mitchell supplied to Lovians and Borders Police in the aftermath. Pupils at St David's High School were informed of the death of Jody in an assembly carried out just before the school broke off for summer holidays. The school then allowed pupils to hold two memorial services. Within days, the path leading to the scene of Jodie's body had been covered in flowers and notes paying respects. Luke Mitchell was photographed leaving a bouquet of red and white roses along with a note that quoted Nirvana frontman Kurt Cobain which read, The finest day I ever had was when tomorrow never came. Investigations continued into the murder over the following weeks, with no conclusive evidence or smoking guns discovered. 
Lovians and Borders Police took an unusual step in the aftermath and released statements taken by various witnesses due to the particularly violent nature of the crime. They hoped this would jog memories and help supply them the information they would need to secure an arrest in the case. They also staged reconstructions of Jody's journey in one of the biggest investigations ever completed within their division. In the weeks following Jody's murder, more than 200 police staff were involved in taking 3,150 statements from over 2,000 individuals. On July 4, four days after the murder, detectives searched the Mitchell's home and took several items away for examination. Items taken from Luke's room included more than 20 bottles of liquid, believed to be filled with his own urine, a Marilyn Manson CD, and a calendar featuring the golf rock star. One item of note that was discovered at Luke's home was an empty knife pouch. Luke Mitchell was well known for carrying knives, typically small flick knives and pen knives, but some acquaintances had noted he had larger ones he kept on him sometimes too. Over two weeks into the investigation, there was still no conclusive suspect. Judith Jones released a statement, which was read by her two sisters to appeal for help in finding her daughter's killer. In the statement, she spoke of her devastation and pleaded for anyone with information to come forward. She said that the only thing keeping the family going was the hope of finding the person responsible. Jodie's family had given statements to police at the time as to their version of events on the day of Jodie's murder. However, they soon reissued their statements as they recalled certain further events. A shock revelation came from the statement given by Alan Ovens, Judith's live-in partner. Alan stated that he had received a call from Luke Mitchell around 5.40pm in which Luke asked Alan if he knew where Jody was. Alan informed Luke that Jody had left a while ago to which Luke replied, quote, Okay, cool. This version of events directly contrasted with Luke's statement that he did not know Jody was on her way to meet with him that night. Due to this, he soon found himself cast into the media spotlight and the police's purview as the prime suspect in the murder of Jodie Jones. In light of this, five weeks after the murder of Jodie, Luke Mitchell was once again brought in for questioning. In a four hour long interview, Luke maintained his story that he had been at home, helping with dinner and did not know that Jodie was on her way to meet him. He went on to talk about their relationship, saying that they enjoyed the same music interests had a similar style of dressing and never had a proper argument as he said we disagreed about some things but we never argued we were very close detective constable alan towers who was conducting the interview noted that luke was extremely calm throughout his entire statement rarely displaying signs of emotion during the search of the mitchell's home police noted that a wood burner in the back garden contained burned material which they later tested and discovered to be the remains of cloves. Neighbours reported remembering a smell of smoke emanating from the Mitchell's house in the days previous to the discovery. Examinations on the remains of the burned cloves turned up no forensic evidence. On reviewing the items taken from Mitchell's room after the murder, a DVD which had been removed flagged up a potential link. According to Luke, he had purchased the Marilyn Manson CD just two days after Jodie's body had been discovered and as a bonus, it came with a DVD. On the film, it showed a handheld camera being used as two occupants in a car travel while a trance style music plays over Manson's ramblings. The camera then moves from the car to a wooded area where the viewer can see foliage and undergrowth lit by torch as it then pans to two girls who appear to be bound together. There are then flash images shown which appear to show a young girl lying naked on the ground. Without concrete evidence pinning Mitchell to the murder, 
he was let go. However, it would not be the end of the questioning for him, nor of the accusations being cast against him, both locally and in the media. Luke's face was being used in all forms of media daily, directly linking him with the murder. This type of coverage is typically not allowed in Scotland to enable the suspect to remain unprejudiced by the weight of public opinion at trial. The media flouted this by only ever naming Luke as a witness. Despite naming him as a witness, they made use of subtle imagery, placement and innuendo to imply a closer link to him having committed the crimes than their very narrow definition of witness would suggest. This included utilising images of Luke, whose style of dressing and self-presentation were unusual to most, pulling menacing faces or looking deadpan into the camera. The police, whilst focusing on Luke Mitchell, were still openly investigating any and all leads. They conducted subsequent searches of the area in Rowan's Dyke, where Jodie's body had been found, but failed to turn up any further evidence or a murder weapon. On July 21, police introduced roadblocks in the area where they were able to question passing motorists in a push for any possible sightings on the day. More than 600 motorists were questioned, but the information they supplied, if any, did not push the case any further ahead. By August 19, 2003, Karine Mitchell received a letter from Midlovian Council's Education Director, Ronald Mackay, which stated Luke was to be excluded from school to, quote, ensure good order and the safety of other students. Luke was at this time a suspect, but no evidence had been found to link him to the crime and no charges had been formally levied against him to give the school authority on which to base their exclusion. The media circus was, however, in full swing and firmly focused on Luke, which was the likely basis for their actions. The Mitchell family's lawyer responded directly to Ronald Mackay's letter, stating the ban should be lifted before the end of the week or the family would take legal action against the decision. The following week, the ban was revoked and Luke returned to school. There were no parameters put on his attendance and he was allowed to mingle with his classmates. Given the unwanted attention he experienced at school, Luke did not turn up for the following week or much at all thereafter. On September 3rd, Jodie's body was released to her family to be laid to rest in Gorebridge, Edinburgh. Jodie's family had warned Luke Mitchell to stay away as they did not want him near her ceremony. Luke Mitchell respected their decision. However, a live TV interview for Sky News was organised at his home on the very same day. Mitchell sat on his sofa wearing a black jumper and trousers. He had his blonde hair parted in the middle and his mother Karine sat next to him with her hands on his shoulders. When asked about his experience since the murder of Jodie by reporter James Matthews, Luke told him, quote, It's just been worse than a nightmare. At least a nightmare you wake up from eventually, but this, you can't wake up from it. In a particularly in-depth discussion, Luke discussed the difficulties he had, with the worst part being his vivid recollection of how he had found Jodie that night. When he was asked whether he felt the finger had been pointed towards him, he stated that he felt he was being tried by the media, without a charge against him. He noted the police had other suspects, that they had been conducting other inquiries, yet it only seemed to be him who had been linked to the murder. Having stated to James Matthews that he had an alibi for that night, and the police knew this, Matthews outright asked Luke Mitchell if he had killed Jodie Jones. Mitchell stated once again that much less than murder Jodie, he had never even argued or fell out with her. Luke Mitchell had given a firm defence of himself, although one question within the interview did raise eyebrows. When asked whether he had burnt any clothes or whether a specific image was his missing knife, he replied that the burning of the clothes wasn't them, 
the report in question simply stated that a female relative of the suspect admitted to burning clothes. It was noted in the aftermath that Luke did not answer the question related to the knife. Instead, he chose only to answer regarding the burning of clothes. At the conclusion of the interview, Luke Mitchell stated how much he misses Jodie and how he is reminded of her every day. The interview had been set up by the Mitchell family as an opportunity to show Luke was innocent and he had been unfairly judged in the media. After it aired, it had the opposite effect. Many people at the time felt the way in which he carried himself and the specific words he had used when he spoke had in fact cast more suspicion on him. Pictures then surfaced showing Luke attending the grave of Jodie later that same day. He had went against the family's wishes for him to stay away, albeit attending once they had left. He left flowers and a poem he had written for Jodie. This again angered supporters of the Jones family who viewed Luke's acts as disrespectful. On September 8th, Luke returned to school. His attendance this time lasted only two hours. Headmistress Marion Doherty advised Luke upon speaking with him that he would be separated from other students and would be taking classes by himself. Luke was unwilling to have these rules forced upon him and an argument ensued. The resulting incident ended with Luke being suspended for three days. Rather than returning after three days, he instead returned nearly a month later, on October 2nd. Once he arrived, the school notified him once again that he would now be receiving one-to-one tuition. The family's lawyer stated that Luke was now happy with this arrangement as he wanted a return to normality to focus on his studies. His returning academic focus was not to last for long. In late November, Lovians and Borders Police submitted their report to the Procurator Fiscal, Scotland's public prosecutor. The report was submitted by the police on November 21, but just a few days later, whilst the police's findings were still under consideration, the document leaked to the media. A frenzy ensued as the leaked documents confirmed Luke Mitchell was the sole suspect in the Jodie Jones murder case. The Mitchells were now being represented by famed Edinburgh solicitor Nigel Beaumont. He issued a statement in response which heavily criticised the perceived victimisation of Luke by the Lovian and Borders police. Beaumont stated that the Mitchells' home had been subject to vigilante attacks that had left Luke and his mother shaken with no action being taken by the local police. He further asked police to find out the source of the leak and demanded punitive action be taken. Legally, were a case to be brought against Luke Mitchell, as a minor there should be a ban on him being named even after charge. However, due to the publicity already garnered, his anonymity would be impossible. A police spokesperson made a statement in kind noting that at no point had any individual been named publicly by them and pushed it back on Mr Beaumont for publicising the issue. They did not mention the leak, nor its source. Christmas and New Year had come and gone, with Luke Mitchell often appearing in column inches being linked to the murder, but no formal charges forthcoming. Lovian and Borders Police who were by now desperately trying to find the missing link to secure a conviction, confirmed in January of 2004 that they were now in contact with FBI officials for assistance. The force had a pre-existing relationship with officials from Quantico after they had assisted a task force which Lovians and Borders had been a part of in the search for Robert Black, covered in Case 8 of Skinwalker. One route that police had also taken was to contact Professor Paul Ekman, a man known as the Human Lie Detector. Ekman was one of the most respected in his field of emotions and their relationship to facial expressions. Officials from Edinburgh had flown to California to meet with Ekman, 
and have him review the TV interview Luke Mitchell had given to Sky News. Ekman spent several hours reviewing the footage, slowing it down to frame by frame to analyse minuscule movements. Professor Ekman then delivered his verdict that he agreed with police in having suspicions over Luke Mitchell. He noted that the expressions on Mitchell's face as he delivers his interview is one of delight. A term used by Ekman was duping delight, which he explained was the gratification that comes from duping the people he is telling the story to. In early March of 2004, Kareen Mitchell was interviewed by the Evening News newspaper in which she stated that she felt the entire investigation had dragged on for too long. In her words, Luke had, quote, now gone from a 14-year-old boy to a 24-year-old man with the pressure he was under. She stated that the police and education authority had wrecked her son's life. In response to media coverage, Stating that Luke's interview on the day of Jodie's funeral had been emotionless, she stated. Luke told me before he went on TV that he would never cry in public. She also stated that she had seen Luke the night of the murder and there hadn't been a mark on him. Karine finished by posing an open question to the investigators, noting that the police had Luke's DNA, half of the contents of her home, most of Luke's clothes, and a log burner from her back garden. She asked, if Luke was guilty, why had he not been arrested? Given his age, if he was guilty, would he not have cracked under the pressure of questioning from senior police officers? The interviewer did not answer Karine's questions. By the way, have you ever heard of Podcorn? Podcorn is a marketplace connecting podcasters to amazing podcast sponsorship opportunities such as host read ads, interview segments and a host of others. They've not just gotten us here at Skinwalker involved with some great brands for future collaborations but they've gone one step further and even sponsored today's episode. It's an awesome platform for both podcasters and advertisers which reduces the hassle in getting your advertising off the ground. Podcorn care about their affiliated podcasts and they're on hand to protect you, give guidance about how to approach advertisers and how to market your podcast in a way that works for you. In terms of getting advertisers as a creator, you simply put together a small proposal for advertisers who you're interested in working with and set what you think is a fair value for your airtime. Once they accept, Podcorn puts you together in the workroom to tie together the last of the pieces. It's collaborative, but you never lose any creative control or rights to your podcast. And payment once everything is complete is super simple. For advertisers, it's just the same process from the other side of the glass. Super neat and super simple. We've put a link in the show notes for Podcorn for those of you who want to start to explore sponsorship opportunities or start monetizing your podcast. Thanks for listening. Now let's get back to the episode. On April 14th, 2004, police passed threshold and with the authorization of the procurator fiscal, executed an arrest on Luke Mitchell, along with his mother Karine and his brother Shane. Luke appeared at Edinburgh Sheriff Court the following day to be charged with Jodie's murder. When in the dock, he made no plea or further declaration and was to be held in remand and committed for examination. Also on Luke Mitchell's charge sheet was a further unrelated allegation in respect of the Misuse of Drugs Act. Karine and Shane Mitchell were charged with perverting the course of justice. On April 22nd, Luke Mitchell was brought to appear in court in a private hearing. The presiding judge had informed him of the intended prosecution and that he will be put in a full trial in front of a jury of his peers for the murder of Jodie Jones. After this, Luke was once again remanded to secure accommodation. Luke Mitchell was at this time only 15 years old. As such, 
media blackouts were enforced for details from the case. The media, who had previously utilised Luke Mitchell's status as a witness to flout underage reporting limitations, had not been made aware of the developments in the case once it had made its way into the courts. As such, news on the case went quiet over the following months and had begun to drift out of people's daily view, given the case was currently in pre-trial proceedings. On July 24, a significant development took place which enabled the case to come firmly back into the view of the public. Luke Mitchell turned 16 years old and in the eyes of the law, he was no longer classified as a minor. Newspapers immediately jumped on the development. Many even ran with the same headline, named Jodie Jones' murder accused, revealed as Luke Mitchell. With the removal of much of the law obstructing them in the area, the media quickly moved on to the question of who was Luke Mitchell. Luke Mitchell was born on July 24, 1988, to parents Kareen and Phil. Luke's father Phil was an electrician, while Kareen was the manager of Scott's Caravan Park in Dalkeith. Luke was the second child of the couple, with his older brother Shane having been born in 1980. Luke was a keen fan of pony and horse riding in his youth, something his parents supported him in. His parents split when Luke was 11 years old, and his time was then split between spending weekdays at his mother's house and weekends with his father. Luke had an extremely close bond with Mother Kareen, and she was extremely protective over her son. Shane noted that he often felt like an outsider within his own home, given the closeness between Kareen and Luke. In his teenage years, Luke attended the army cadets in Bonnie Rig, only a few miles from his home. Luke's interest in music had grown during his teenage years, as he became extremely interested in rock star Marilyn Manson and the bands Korn and Nirvana. Luke was charming to friends and girlfriends, however, his behaviour was less than exemplary. He was known for skipping classes and becoming aggressive towards teachers. He was both a victim of bullying and a bully himself. A music teacher had caught him in the act of trying to grab a fellow pupil by the neck and it was recommended he see an education psychologist, however he refused the help. An English teacher had referred Luke to a guidance counsellor after discovering some troubling writings in his workbook along with an essay he had completed. The class were asked to imagine the end of the world and write their feelings in an essay. A passage from Luke's essay read, quote, If you ask me, God is just a futile excuse, at the most for a bunch of fools to go around annoying others who want nothing to do with them. Are these people insane? Open your eyes. People like you need satanic people like me to keep the balance. Once you shake hands with the devil, you then have truly experienced life. Look title to essay, Pain and Suffering, and end the piece with the words, Lucifer is a fallen angel. Some of his other former friends, lovers and flings also held reservations about him. Allegedly, at 12 years old, Luke threatened his then girlfriend with a knife after she had refused to have sex with him. Mitchell later claimed it had only been a joke. Due to his petty drug dealing, he was often seen with what other kids his age would deem to be a lot of money. He was known to carry a knife in a small holster, either a pen knife or a flick knife. He was the clear leader of his friend group from the goth subculture, controlling the group which would hang around in the woods of Woodburn in Dalkeith. The group would walk together through the trees and bushes, arriving at an area they called China Gardens, where they were free to smoke cannabis without interruption due to its remote location. One girl would later recall a statement made by Luke while they were present at the China Gardens, stating He said that he could just imagine himself going out and getting stoned and killing somebody and how funny it would be. Despite his behaviour 
and the report she received about her son, Luke's mother seen him as a sweet, innocent young boy who was just doing exactly what teenagers do. Jodie felt similarly strong about Luke. In one diary entry she wrote, I think I am actually in love with Luke. Well, nearly. God, I think I'd die if he finished with me. When I'm not with him, I want to be. When I'm with him, I'm happy. He's the only person that makes me forget about most of the shit in my life. But sometimes when I can't forget, he makes me feel better. No matter what he says, I believe him. And that is really dangerous. Despite Jodie's adoration and dedication to him, Luke had also been in a relationship with a girl he had met while on holiday. Kimberly Thompson from Kenmore in Perthshire, an area just over 50 miles from Edinburgh, had met Luke Mitchell in the summer of 2002 while he had been on holiday in the area with his mother. Luke had become friendly with Kimberly's brother and he had introduced the pair. After leaving Perth to go home, the pair had decided to become boyfriend and girlfriend and shared texts and phone calls regularly. Luke once showed a photo of his other girlfriend Kimberly to one of his friends and he was shocked to see the uncanny resemblance to Jodie Jones, later remarking, that he believed at first it was a picture of Jodie he was looking at. The trial of Luke Mitchell began on November 11th, 2004. He appeared in court with his long hair tied back in a ponytail. He wore a white shirt with blue tie and grey trousers. Mitchell was being represented by one of Scotland's top lawyers, Donald Finlay QC and he had lodged two defences for Mitchell to the murder of Jodie. His first defence was one of alibi and the second one of incrimination. Luke sat with his head bowed throughout proceedings, looking up only when the jury were shown maps and geographical images of the area in question. Within day one of the trial, the jury were shown two trees which had the initials JJ and LM carved into the bark. On day two of the trial, Lord Nimmo Smith warned the jury that they would be shown photographs of the crime scene alongside pictures of Jodie which would be highly distressing. The photographs showed Jodie's naked body lying spread out near a high wall bordering the pathway. Despite the wounds having been described within the news, it was highly distressing for the jurors when close-up pictures showed Jodie lying on her back with a deep gash in her stomach and a slash mark to her left breast. The images demonstrated to them areas of her face and neck which were extremely bloody. Further pictures showed the wounds to her cheek, ear and throat. The first witnesses were called to testify, whereby it was discussed that Jodie was often seen at lunchtimes smoking cannabis with Luke Mitchell and their friends. Many repeated that they remember seeing Mitchell carrying a knife which he used to cut the cannabis. The trial was then halted on November 16 as two jurors were discharged due to personal difficulties. It is not confirmed if this was in relation to the graphic nature of the case. The case resumed once again on November 18 two days later with a new jury in place. The jury were once again informed of the geography of the area and shown the pictures of Jodie and the crime scene. The prosecution stated that Luke Mitchell had in their words guilty knowledge of the crime which would lead him to find the body so quickly in poor conditions. Donald Finlay defended Luke's statement that it was in fact his dog that had become attracted to a smell and led Luke to Jodie. The prosecution said that the spot where it had been found was over a wall from the walk path and was hidden amongst the trees and undergrowth which any searcher was unlikely to look at. A visit to the murder scene for the jury was arranged so that they could be walked along the route to where the body was found. Prosecutors also cast aspersions on Luke's alibi that he was at home cooking dinner. Luke's brother Shane was put on the stand to be cross-examined. Shane, 
when asked for his version of events on the day, stated that he was at home viewing pornography on the internet before his mother had gotten home from work. When questioned, he said he would not have done this had anyone else been present in the house at the time and he had even left his room door open so he could hear if anyone came home. This would have given him time to close his choice in entertainment without being discovered. The prosecution then posed a question to Shane. How could he be the only one in the house viewing internet pornography, whilst Luke was also supposedly in the house making and burning the dinner? Would he not have known Luke had been in or smelled the burning dinner? Shane confirmed from the stand that he had not seen his brother in the family home, nor been aware of his presence at the time which Luke had stated he was home. The wood burner was also submitted as evidence. There was a possibility that the jury were to consider that Luke's clothes may have been those discovered burned within the device. No forensic evidence had been recovered to support this, but the jury were also informed that the Mitchell's neighbours had noted the typical smell of the burner had been noted in the aftermath of Jodie's murder. One of the key focuses was also Luke Mitchell's character. Prosecutors honed in on his love for his idol, Marilyn Manson. It was discovered that Luke had taken a keen interest in a particular painting of Manson's, the Black Dahlia. The Black Dahlia was the name given to the true crime murder of Elizabeth Short. An aspiring actress, she moved to Los Angeles and was found murdered in Limeert Park in 1947. Her murder was brutal, with her body being severed in half alongside severe mutilation taking place. Marilyn Manson had already caused controversy when he initially publicised his paintings. The paintings by Manson show a naked body with stab and slash wounds, alongside slash marks to the abdomen and cuts to the breast, as well as a cut going from lip to ear across the cheek. These wounds were almost identical to those Jodie had sustained during her murder. Most disturbingly, the interest Luke Mitchell had taken in these images had intensified in the aftermath of Jodie's murder. His purchase of the Golden Age of Grotesque album, which featured a 10 minute video on Manson's imagery had been purchased only two days after Jodie's murder. The Crown did agree that there were similarities between the murder and the paintings, however these were deemed as circumstantial and not probative in and of themselves. A knife pouch belonging to Luke Mitchell was also shown to the jury. Inside the pouch there had been markings made by a blade. The markings were the initials JJ followed by the years Jodie had lived, 1989 to 2003. Underneath these dates were the numerals 666, a number typically associated with Satanism. It was also noted that a number of satanic symbols had been drawn by Luke on his school workbooks. On December 13, Jodie's grandmother Alice Walker took to the stand for questioning. In her initial interviews, she had agreed that Mia, Luke's German Shepherd, had led him towards the area in question. However, in a later meeting, she had amended her statement to state that Luke had gone off in another direction of his own accord, then shouted on them to say he had found something. She offered the second version of her statement when in the witness box. In her words, Janine Jones' fiancé Stephen climbed over the wall to where Luke was standing. He then climbed back over in a quote, state. Alice also distinctly remembered he had been sick afterwards. Alice noted she had then herself climbed over the wall and was shown behind a tree to a spot where the body lay. Then asked if she would have checked over the other side of the wall had it not been for Luke Mitchell. Alice noted she would not have, stating, quote, I would never have looked over the wall. The only reason Jodie was there but she went there with someone she knew, as no stranger would have got her across that wall. Derek Scrimger, a forensic scientist, was then brought forward. He explained that he arrived at the scene the following morning, around 8am. 
a colleague of his had been there earlier but had been unable to climb the wall due to having a bad back. As such, shift changeover was the first opportunity to have a forensic scientist on scene. During the period from Jodie's body being discovered and Mr Scrimger arriving, it was accepted that her body had been moved from the position it had been found in. Her clothes had also been collected together for evidence. Derek Scrimger noted that blood staining on the wall next to where her body lay could have been caused by Jodie or her killer brushing against the wall. A second blood stain which was lowered down on the wall was consistent with blood spray from an artery. When he was asked if the blood spray being low on the wall would suggest she had been on the ground when this took place, Scrimger responded that given the angles and the way the blood hit the wall, Jodie would either have been kneeling or sitting. Alan Turnbull QC for the prosecution, then asked if the assailant had been behind Jodie when she was low down at the wall and her throat was cut. Was it conceivable she had collapsed onto the wall and down to the ground thereafter, as the artery had been severed? Mr Scrimger replied that it was one possibility, and then added that if Jodie's throat had been cut from behind, the blood would have travelled forward and may have avoided going on the attacker entirely. He then qualified this by noting that when her clothes had been removed, it would be more than likely that blood would have transferred onto the attacker if none had done so during the attack. After Mr Scrimger's testimony, the day was adjourned. When they returned, the focus changed from the location to items recovered from the accused. Luke Mitchell's clothes had been taken for DNA tests at a lab using what was at the time the most sensitive DNA testing in Britain. Forensic scientist Susan Ewer examined articles of Luke Mitchell's clothing and found only one DNA profile which matched Jodie's on a pair of trousers. As Jodie and Luke were in a relationship, she mentioned that any matching DNA might have been from innocent contact and no strong inferences could be drawn. PC Anita Dow was then called to the stand. PC Dow was one of the officers who had searched the Mitchell's home in the aftermath. She described Luke's bedroom as being in a state of, quote, disgusting, smelly squalor. A duvet lay on the floor, which was apparently where Mitchell slept. She came across drugs, paraphernalia, the knife pouch previously discussed in front of the jury, and also a mail order catalogue invoice which showed Corinne Mitchell had bought a skunting knife for Luke. A skunting knife is a portmanteau name used for a hunting knife which has sharp edges making it easier to skin a catch. After being shown the pouch which had been submitted as evidence two days previously bearing Jody's name, Years Alive and Satanic References, PC Dow confirmed it was the same one recovered that day. However, she did note that they found no knife to go along with it. The prosecution noted that it may well be that the knife was a replacement to one which had been allegedly lost around the time of Jodie's murder. Detective Constable Alan Tibbles was then called, as he had interviewed Mitchell in the aftermath. Luke Mitchell had told DC Towers he wasn't concerned about Jodie not showing up as he had come to the conclusion that she had just changed her mind. He failed to mention the fact that he had phoned Jodie's home and asked Alan Ovens where she was. As the police were unaware of this at the time, they had been unable to ask Luke about the discrepancy. On January 14, 2005, over two months after the commencement of Luke Mitchell's trial, Kareen Mitchell was brought to the stand. After she had taken her oath, Donald Finlay implored her, quote, If you have any knowledge at all that Luke is responsible for Jodie's death, now is the time to say so, whether it is your son or not. Mrs Mitchell replied that her son did not kill Jodie Jones. Donald Finlay asked her to confirm she was telling the truth, which Kareen Mitchell affirmed. Finlay then continued to grill Kareen, stating, quote, Although I am your son's defence advocate, I, like everyone else in this court, 
I'm here in the interest of justice. If you know Luke killed Jody, for goodness sake tell us now. Mrs Mitchell then looked Mr Finlay firmly in the eye and said he did not kill Jody. Prosecutor Alan Turnbull had advised Corrine that the Crown had withdrawn the charge for perverting the course of justice. However, he went on to accuse Corrine of covering for her son by not telling the full versions of events that day. She was then warned that she was under oath and perjury within court was an entirely more serious matter than that with which she had initially been charged. In an unusual tact, Alan Turnbull began to ask Corrine about events in a tattoo shop in October of 2003, whereby it was alleged that she had falsified documents to enable her son to get a skull-like tattoo on his arm in an Edinburgh tattoo shop. When asked if she had lied about her son's age and provided documents which bore the name of someone much older, Mrs Mitchell denied the allegation. At this, Mr Turnbull replied, quote, You are struggling to keep this series of untrue comments together, aren't you, Mrs Mitchell? When Kareen issued another denial, she followed up by stating she wouldn't lie to protect her son either. This was rebutted by Mr Turnbull, who raised whether the pair, rather than being mother and son, were more akin to accomplices. Again, Kareen Mitchell vehemently denied the allegation. When asked in light of her response, how someone in parental control would allow their son to amass a collection of urine bottles in their room, Karine declined to answer. The assault by the prosecution was not to end there. Alan Turnbull then rose to tell the room that three calls had been logged from Luke Mitchell's mobile phone to his mother's on the night Jody had been murdered. One particularly suspiciously timed call was made at 6.40pm he then asked whether it was a coincidence that neighbours claimed that a log burner was operating in the Mitchell Garden between 6.30pm and 7.30pm on the evening of Jodie's death. In his opinion, burning clothing related to the murder. Mrs Mitchell replied that the wood burner had not been in use that night and if she was in any way mistaken, it would have been plants and weeds she had been burning, not forensic evidence. The jury was further told that Mitchell had sustained injuries to his legs after Jody died. Donald Finlay for the defence stepped in and stated that a doctor had agreed that injuries to Luke Mitchell's legs had not been sustained around the time of the murder. The presentation of evidence was still ongoing on January 17th when Andrina Bryson took the stand for the prosecution. Andrina lived locally and had left her house to drive to the supermarket and then on to East Houses as she wanted to drive by a house which was for sale. She had only intended to take a quick look at the outside of the property and then head home. As she headed out of East Houses sometime between 5 to 5.30pm, she seen a young girl matching Jodie's description at the end of Rowan's Dyke Path with a young boy. When shown a picture of Luke Mitchell, she identified him as the boy she had seen standing with Jodie. This ran in direct contrast with Luke Mitchell's statement that he had not seen Jodie at all on the night of her murder. Jodie's cousins John Ferris and Gordon Dickey then took the stand. They had been brought forward by the defence in an attempt to promote other potential suspects as the pair had been seen driving a moped around the area around the same time. However, their involvement was dismissed once evidence was presented which placed their moped in the area far earlier than 5pm. With the incredibly lengthy trial drawing into its final day, the prosecution finished by asking the jury to consider the evidence they had provided. Whilst only circumstantial, there was a mountain of evidence against Luke Mitchell. He had found Jodie's body in a spot which would not have been searched by most extremely quickly for that matter. Furthermore, his alibi was not watertight and seemed false. It had a massive hole given the testimony of his brother Shane, who believed Luke was not home after school. There was a possibility of clothing being burnt and suspect items which pointed to him knowing something others did not about Jodie's fate. Finally, 
he could be placed in the location of the crime at the likely time of the murder by the testimony of Andrina Bryson. Prosecutors highlighted that whilst these all may be single links in a chain, they could be brought together to a consideration of murder. When further considering Luke Mitchell's allegations of partner abuse, heavy substance misuse, outlook on life, and general misanthropy. Given there was no credible alternative provided by the defence, the prosecution argued there could only be one finding, guilty beyond all reasonable doubt. Over two and a half months since the trial had first begun, the jury were finally sent away on January 21 to deliberate. It took them only six hours to strike a unanimous decision. The courtroom was packed as both families had been separated on opposite sides in anticipation of the verdict. Judge Lord Nemo Smith warned the courtroom to respect the decision and he would not accept any outbursts. According to a jury of his peers, in relation to the murder of Jodie Jones, the jury found Luke Mitchell guilty beyond all reasonable doubt. Judith Jones, overcome with the decision, punched the air and screamed, Mrs Mitchell, go to hell. Luke's mother, Karine, sat with her head bowed as she began to tremble. Luke Mitchell showed no emotion as he simply stared straight ahead. Sentencing was deferred for three weeks to allow the social departments to obtain reports, but Mitchell, then only 16, was told he would likely be detained without limit of time. As Judith Jones walked out of the Edinburgh High Court, Detective Superintendent Craig Dobby, who had led the murder inquiry, hugged her. Karine Mitchell left an hour and a half later after the trial had ended and was forced to sprint through the waiting journalists and Jones family supporters who screamed abuse at her. Luke Mitchell was removed via a rear entrance and transported to a young offenders institution. The trial was one of Scotland's most lengthy ever for a single accused and cost over £400,000. The sentencing of Luke Mitchell then took place on February 11, 2004, where Lord Nemo Smith sentenced him to a standard life tariff. Luke was told he would spend a minimum of 20 years in prison before being considered for parole. Eighteen months after the trial, Scott Forbes, a resident of Dalkeith, had come forward to state that he had potential evidence that could clear Luke Mitchell's name. Forbes stated that a local man, Mark Kane, had been near the woods on that day and had acted suspiciously in the days following. Forbes highlighted Kane as a drug addict. He claimed that he had scratches on his face in the days following the murder and he had also written an essay at college titled Killing a Girl in the Woods. Donald Finlay supported these claims and stated Kane ticked all of the same boxes as Luke Mitchell had. After speaking to a lecturer at New Battle Abbey College, it was confirmed that no such essay was ever written, and Scott Forbes' claims were further cast into doubt when John Beckett, acting on behalf of the Crown, uncovered the fact that Mr Forbes had concocted the plan in an effort to sell the salacious story to newspapers and magazines. After constant ruminations about appeals, in November 2006, Luke Mitchell was granted leave to appeal against his conviction at the Court of Criminal Appeal in Edinburgh on the grounds of the trial judge's refusal to hear the original case outside of Edinburgh, which may have prejudiced his hearing as it did not take into account the potential for local gossip and publicity to impact the trial hearing. Similarly, the jurors were not put in hotels for the duration, allowing them to come home and potentially be exposed to external influences on their judgement. The Court of Criminal Appeal in Edinburgh heard Mitchell's appeal in full throughout February of 2008. However, in May 2008, his original conviction was upheld, ruling that there was sufficient evidence in law that Mitchell could be convicted on. One of the few areas with which the judiciary agreed with Mitchell's lawyers was that the police's questioning of Mitchell on 14th of August 2003 had been outrageous and was to be deplored. 
a further appeal for Mitchell's conviction was heard on February 2, 2011. It was refused by a two to one majority. The Lords in agreement stated they found the evidence to be sufficient. However, they believed that the sentencing seemed harsh and a more appropriate sentence may have been set at 15 years. Nonetheless, they lacked the legal authority to reduce Luke Mitchell's sentence since they had agreed with the initial trial judge's decision. Dr Sandra Lean, who lived in Dalkeith at the time of the murder, has also publicly supported the family since the conviction. Her PhD thesis studied, quote, the factors that led to wrongful convictions and why ordinary people are completely unaware of them. She has written a book on her experience with the Luke Mitchell case, Innocence Betrayed. Throughout the book, she reiterates her belief that Luke is innocent and posits a number of local men as potential suspects for the crime. None of these men have ever been under police consideration and police steadfastly believe in the conviction of Luke Mitchell. In 2013, both Luke and Kareen Mitchell undertook polygraph tests to support their claims of innocence. The tests were carried out by Terry Mullins of the British Polygraph Association. The video of Luke Mitchell's test was published by Kareen online. Luke sat with his eyes closed throughout and appeared to be focusing on his breathing as he answered the questions. Mullins asked him, did he know for certain where Jodie's body would be found? Mitchell responds, no. Mullins can then be heard asking him to stay very still after this answer. Mullins then asks, prior to Jodie going missing, do you remember intentionally lying to a police officer? Luke once again responds, no. It has been noted by many that this question states prior to Jodie going missing, suggesting this would be before the murder. When asked, did you stab Jodie on the 30th of June 2003, Mitchell once again responds, no. The video ends before Mitchell's eyes are opened and once again, Luke Mitchell displays little to no emotion on the tape. The video finishes with Mullins reporting that his polygraph test confirmed Luke Mitchell had been telling the truth in all answers. There have been a number of key issues raised with these tests. One being they are inadmissible in Scotland as evidence. The second being that the Mitchell family paid for the test which may hamper the veracity of the information. And thirdly, polygraph tests are fallible in nature. On June 30, 2013, Jodie's family paid a special tribute at her grave as family members gathered to celebrate her life, placing her favourite sunflowers by her grave. It is a tradition they do yearly as they leave flowers at her grave along with the path where she was found and other special places to them. Finally feeling that Corrine Mitchell had gone too far in the defence of her son, Judith Jones attended Scott's Caravan Park in early September of 2013 to confront her. A heated discussion in the reception of the Caravan Park office was alleged to have become physical. Judith allegedly struck Corrine and grabbed her hair. Corrine further alleges that Judith was drunk throughout the encounter, a claim which was denied vehemently by Judith. Despite the altercation, there was no visible damage to any surfaces within the reception of the caravan park. In a final cruel twist to Judith, in July of 2018, local youths stole a special bear which Judith had laid on Jodie's grave. The item was never recovered, despite significant appeals within the media and on Facebook for its return. Luke Mitchell and his mother Kareen still protest Luke's innocence in the case to this day. Thanks for listening everybody. I'd like to finish with a quick recommendation for a podcast I've been listening to a lot recently. Serial Spoon Podcast. I really enjoyed their vast range of episodes 
as well as host Chloe walking you through all the details of the crimes, with my own personal favourite being the episode on Tupac Shakur. The next episode is on Elisa Turney, which is a super interesting case. It's bound to be amazing, so give it a listen.